Ah, no, 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 okay. When mu is zero, you have the most structured case, okay? And gamma is a finite constant. Okay, so I claim that all the results I will present to you, the details of the density don't really matter. What do I mean by that? I mean that for the analysis, we will reconsider this kind of trace ensemble to generate the noise, but actually the results will hold, I claim they hold, as long as you have this kind of empirical uh, density converging to the same distribution, okay? As long as you have that, it's okay. So if it, instead of generating Z really in that form, I was drawing its eigenvalues IID such that their empirical load tends to the same density, then the formulas are the same, okay? But the density has the, to be the one given by the quartic potential. Yes, yes. By, the poten by the potential that you're looking at. Yeah. And actually, in the numerics, what I will do is that instead of simulating a dyson brynell motion to get the eigenvalues, which may, can be complicated, I will generate IID eigenvalues according to the density. All right, so for those that are not too familiar with random matrix theory, this may look weird that as I decrease mu, so I'm, the potential is more and more confining, what you see is that the density develops this kind of two uh, maxima like this while I'm confining more the eigenvalues. Why is that the case? Because actually the density of the eigenvalues when you go in the basis, uh, when you change val uh, variables to go in the basis, this is the density induced and you have a so-called van der Mond repulsion term there. So the eigenvalues try to separate, uh, to rebuild each other. Therefore, I'm putting this fluid of eigenvalues in a very confining potential, but they try to repeat each other, and so at some point they, they start to climb the potential goal, okay? And this is what happens there, okay? All right, so I will consider the Bayesian framework. So I'm writing down the Bayes optimal posterior distribution, which knows about the prior distribution on the signal that generated the ground truth signal, and here is my likelihood, okay? PY is the, no is the normalization. And what are the objects I want to study? Uh, like Jean-Christophe, the mutual information uh, between the signal and the data, and the minimum mean square error, okay? So the uh, square deviation and provisions norm between the ground truth estimator and the so-called minimum mean square estimator, which is the Gibbs mean. Yes, I don't know where it is. There should be a V also after the trace, I guess. Sorry? Can we stop the noise? Uh, I think yeah. I'm just receiving mails. Just turn off the Wi Fi. No, so it's just. Alright, turn off the on your computer. Like, yes. put, it, put it in airplane mode. But I'm muted, that's why it's fine. <laughs> Okay. Ah, there should be a V after the trace, I guess. Yep. Ah, yes, again, I'm sorry, this is a typo. There is a V here. There is the potential. Trace of V. Yes, trace of V. And the V which should stand here is my quartic plus quadratic potential. Okay? So the two quantities which are hard to compute there is this Shannon entropy of the data and this MMSE. This term, if you know the potential, it's easy to understand. Okay. All right, so what is known from the inference side, so I will not focus on the spin glass literature connected to this kind of models. Uh, so in the Bayesian optimal setting, so without structure, meaning that the noise is really Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, independent entries, up to this limit with constraint, we know essentially everything, uh, we've heard about it a lot. So rho is the semicircle low, and we have a long list of people that have worked on this. When you consider spectral algorithms, in the case where you have structure, meaning the noise is of the form I presented, we also know essentially everything you may be interested in, I mean, at the level of this talk. In particular, we know the performance of the spectral estimator, which takes essentially the first eigenvector of the data, 
and construct this rank one matrix with an optimal scaling factor here, which is aware of the density of eigenvalues and of the signal to noise ratio. And this is a result by Benay George and uh, Nada Kuditi. They studied that problem and the associated generalized uh, BBB transition. From the point of view of Bayesian uh, in France, we know again uh, what happens when there is some structure. What happens when you use a certain AMP algorithms that I will present, which end up being suboptimal. And this is one uh, discovery of, uh, of this uh, work. It was kind of conjectured to be the proper AMP. It ends up not being the case. And this is an AMP based on work by Hopper and Winter on the so-called ADATAP formalism that I will present, adaptive TIP equations, that has been made rigorous by Zufan in 2022. So this is an AMP that is aware, again, of the density of eigenvalues of the noise. So it knows the noise statistics. It knows the prior. But still, it won't output something optimal, independently of hard phases or things like this. Even in high SNR regimes, where it should work, it's suboptimal, and I will explain why. OK, we also know what happens when you have a certain level of mismatch, still in the case without structure in the noise, so independent entries. It has been studied recently by uh, Farzad Kamali and Nicolas Macri at EPFL, where they studied a case of a semicircle distribution of eigenvalues, so Gaussian noise, but you have a mismatch in the signal to noise ratio. The true SNR is not the one used by the statistician to perform in France. Recently, together with uh, a colleague, thank you, from Huawei, Marco and Manuel, we studied the case where, um, so, Bayesian in France, so we study a posterior distribution, but it, which is mismatched again, and also the performance of an AMP making the same wrong assumptions. And what are these wrong assumptions? Again, a mismatch SNR, like in this case. But now the noise in the true data is again structure. comes from this kind of trace ensembles. But the statistician assumes that the noise is Gaussian. Okay. So for some reason, it cannot access the statistics of the noise. So it makes the most naive assumption, which is Gaussian assumption. And we study the performance, the, the information loss, the, the, the performance in that case. And then you have uh, results in the Bayesian optimal case with what I will call partial structure, meaning that the data points are still independent, okay? But essentially, the low of the data points is allowed to depend on the indices, okay? And there are uh, results by uh, the Bologna group, Diego Alberici, Francesco Camille, Pierluigi Contucci, and Emanuele Mingione that are here, and very recently by uh, Alice Vigione, Justin Clo. Uh, Justin Co, Florent, and Lenka. But the fact that you have still independent entries in the noise implies kind of strong universality results. In particular, you can show that whatever is the channel here, the conditional law, okay, you can reduce the study of that model to the one of an equivalent Gaussian model. Okay? And this really stems from the fact that you have independence. Okay, this Gaussian model here have a variance now that depends on the signal and on the on the entries, but still it collapses to a Gaussian model. It is not expected to be the case in what we're studying here. All right, so what are the results? This, this TV is really messing my computer right now. Okay. <laughs> All right, so the first result is coming from the replica method. So this is conjectured to be exact because we are in the Bayesian optimal setting. We're making a replica symmetry computation, but we have all reasons to believe that it will soon become a theorem. We're showing that the Shannon entropy tends to uh, a saddle point uh, formula, which is an extremum over uh, R3 of a certain variational function. So we have an explicit characterization of this object, from which we can deduce by solving this uh, extremum uh, equation, we can deduce the minimum in square R, where this m is one of these parameters that is extremized over. So generic, I mean, standard kind of uh, results in the replica theory. One surprise, which a posteriori may be not so, pr so surprising for uh, knowing a bit these kind of problems, 
is the following fact. We show that spectral PCA, so the spectral algorithm looking just at the first leading eigenvector of the data, is Bayesian optimal in the case where the priors over the signal is rotationally invariant, so Gaussian or spherical. Okay, so essentially, this rotational invariance in the prior essentially means that you have nothing to exploit from the prior information, and therefore spectral does as good as the Bayesian estimator. Still, it's non-trivial because the Bayesian estimator is a kind of finite temperature estimator, right? You are sampling a measure. The spectral algorithm is the solution of an optimization problem. Okay, it's the first eigenvector. So this was known in the Gaussian case, no? This was known in the Gaussian case, yes, of course, yeah. Algorithmic results, the first uh, thing we, we show is the fact that this kind of natural AMP derived from the work by Hopper and Winter, uh, which has been refined by Zufan, which iterates these equations there, is suboptimal. So this is a standard form of AMP iteration. So here you have the data matrix, which uh, multiplies your current estimator and you remove a certain correction called the Onzager reaction term. Then you apply this quantity, you put this quantity as an argument of a certain denoising function that takes into account the information about the prior, about the signal uh, properties, and you iterate. And this Onzager reaction term is tuned such that the empirical distribution of these quantities here look like Gaussian, okay, to make the iterates convergent. And what we claim is that why here the data is not the correct matrix to use, okay? What we show instead is that for a given potential, for a given statistics of the noise, in the Bayesian optimal setting, to perform Bayesian optimal inference, and therefore what you should use also in AMP, is actually a certain specific polynomial function of this data, which is non-trivially guessable from the potential. It's not that I can tell you, just looking at the potential, what are the coefficients in front of this. I know what's the order of this polynomial, but we didn't yet understand the structure allowing to guess the coefficients right away. There is a non-trivial computation behind that. The base optimal AMP then becomes this iterate, where now the matrix here is this G of Y, okay? But the structure is the same. Matrix uh, multiplication, removal of Onzaga reaction, denoising, and you repeat, okay? So the, the coefficients B of T and I and C of T and I, you can compute in a self-consistent way, I guess. Right? So you need to work, so first these coefficients here are already in that simpler case I, are highly non-trivial in this kind of structured problem, and from the understanding of how it works for this kind of standard recursion, where you have the matrix Y appearing there, we can understand what are those coefficients. But this comes from essentially enforcing the Gaussianity of these quantities. We can understand what should be these corrections. Okay. So yes. Just a question to connect back to the IAE uh, yes. noise. Even there, when the output channel is not additive Gaussian noise, yes. actually the AMP needs to be run with a function of the observed matrix, this Fisher score matrix. So this looks a bit similar in the sense that it's still not surprising that it should be run with a matrix that is not directly the observed matrix. Mm -hmm. Because that's the case also for the IID noise. Um, so okay. is that somewhat different? Uh, I didn't think about it, to be honest, yeah. Uh, I don't remember the form in, the, in this case. Okay. But it's different function in the sense that here is not an entry-wise function, yeah. right? No, it's not an entry-wise function, yes. I see, okay. So, yeah, yes. the Fisher score is entry-wise. Yes. Good point. Okay, thanks. So, the uh, rigorous uh, part of the, the result is the following. We, pr we prove a state evolution for this Bayesian uh, optimal AMP recursion, which essentially says that selecting the correct Onzager reaction terms here, we can show that indeed this F, the, here these quantities, tend in uh, W inverse search time to distance, so essentially they tend weakly uh, towards 
Gaussian distributed random variables, you have here the statistics. So these Gaussian variables is a vector of size t after t iterates. And it is essentially a kind of t-dependent signal-to-noise ratio multiplying a random variable whose statistics is the same as one single entry of the signal, plus a Gaussian noise with a non-trivial covariance. And this covariance is related to these c's here. Okay? And the u's are just obtained by applying the same nonlinearity here, this denoising function, to these Gaussian random variables. Okay. So this is rigorous. All right, so let's check uh, the outcome of all this analysis. So here is a plot where the low of the eigenvalues is the semicircle low. So I'm in the standard setting. Okay. What we plot is in black the replica prediction for the minimum in square error. In blue is the previously considered proper AMP algorithm for that problem, this open and winter slash Zufan iterate, where you use the data matrix right away. Uh, the dots are uh, actual runs on a large instance. And in green, it's the same algorithm, but you use a slightly smarter denoising function, which takes into account the, the history of the algorithm, and that helps the convergence. But the fixed point is supposedly the same, as we verify. Okay? The entries of the signal are Rademacher. Mu equal 1 means that we are in the semicircle case. And as it should, everything collapses, including the state evolution of our base optimal, uh, con conjecturally base optimal AMP and its actual runs. Now let me increase the structure. So now the density of eigenvalues is the orange one. We start to see the two cu curves branching out. And what you observe is that our base optimal state evolution matches perfectly the replica prediction, which strongly suggests that all the scheme is coherent. But still, the finite size effects here are too strong to really distinguish what happened for finite n. But if you further increase the structure, we have the blue density now, you see a clear branching. And indeed, our state evolution still match the replica prediction and the finite size result do as well, OK? So let me mention that even if the replica prediction is not yet rigorous, the fact that we improved over this previous AMP is rigorous, because its fixed point is rigorous and ours as well, OK? Yes. So question, when you look at the spectrum of this matrix after you apply J of the matrix J will, of Y. I will show you exactly that. <laughs> yes. So what happens when you apply the function? <laughs> <laughs> so let me call this function a kind of optimal preprocessing of the data. So here is uh, a recall the expression. Here I'm considering the most structured case in the ensemble I'm, I'm studying, which is mu equals zero. And in that case, to fix this variance condition, this variance being equal to one of the eigenvalues, gamma of zero is 16 over 27. The SNR is 2, so here is the actual eigenvalues for a finite realization and the asymptotic density. You see the spike popping out, we are above the BBP transition. And here is how look the function I'm applying to the matrix, really as a matrix uh, valued function. Again, it's not an entry-wise uh, function. What happens is that you completely clean the spectrum in the sense that it will push all the noisy, let's say the non-informative eigenvalues to the negative part of the axis and will push further to the right the spike. Okay. If you further increase the SNR, the same phenomenon happens. The function now looks like there. And the effect is even stronger. Okay. And notice something interesting is that the point where this function essentially starts to push towards the right axis, the eigenvalues, correspond to very close, it's, it's very close to the actual position of the spike for finite realizations. So essentially, it's a kind of boundary decision that tells you that what should be before should be noise, while if you are after that point here, you're very sure that it's the information. 
I think it's a nice phenomenon to observe. You see now the spike here is much further. It's around 20, while it was at 5 here. And so it's a kind of cleaning of potential rare deviations. Because at finite size, you could have much smaller size here. It's a very big size. You could have rare eigenvalues which lie there. This function will push them strongly towards the negative axis anyway. Okay. At gamma equals zero, when we are in the unstructured case, IID noise, there is no cleaning. This function is the identity, as it should. Because we know that in that case, the usual AMP is optimal as a net What is doing the suboptimal AMP? This, this upper winter fan AMP. I recall the, the recursion there. This curve is again a replica prediction for another problem. And the, the red curve is the AMP fixed point of that recursion. Okay, still Rademacher prior, SNR, MSC. What we understood is that if you write down a mismatch posterior, in the sense that you assume the correct prior, like this AMP does inside this denoising function, it is aware of this PX. But now you assume a Gaussian likelihood. So you take a quadratic potential. Okay. So even if the algorithm is actually aware of the statistics of the noise, it does not try to sample the correct likelihood, the correct posterior distribution. Okay. If you do the replica symmetric analysis for that problem, for this mismatch problem, you realize you get that prediction. So essentially what we show is that this suboptimal AMP solves a kind of replica symmetric approximation to the TIP equations associated with this mismatch posterior. Okay? So now let me, how long do I do? <coughs> 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, perfect. Maybe just a question. Yes. Did Opera and Winter or this other author, Fan, ever claim that this will actually be optimal for, or Let's say isn't it just like It's a not really said, it's not said explicitly, but it's strongly suggested in that paper. Yes. But it's not claimed, though. In Opera and Winter, probably not. Maybe they were just kind of No, no, in Opera and Winter, really, studied this kind of problems without plenty of part, not the actual signal, not the, the, the inference setting. Okay. Mm -hmm. But this algorithm is that directly borrowed from that, mm -hmm. but introducing the plenty of part. The, the B term is, is related to Y or is... Yes, yes, so this B term, this Onzager here, are aware of the correct statistics of the eigenvalues of Y. But is it given in terms of some R transform? Yes. Exactly. It encodes properly the statistics of this Y. But this recursion is trying to sample not the proper measure. Okay. It's not actually sampling, it's solving the TAP equations, but whose the replica symmetric analysis that measure ah, matches. Let me give you some ideas about what is novel in the, the approach. So essentially the, the replica computation is, is standard, but, but non-standard, and I will try it in Y. So we start from the usual uh, replica trick, okay, where you push the expectation over the quenched disorder, which is in this case the data, in particular, in particular the realization of the uh, basis of the noise, this O, Okay, and the eigenvalues. Inside the log, using this identity, here there is already an assumption which is a commutation of limits, but it's the standard assumption is this kind of approaches. Then you need to identify the correct order parameters, as usual. Here you recognize two classical order parameters, the kind of magnetization term, which is the overlap between a sample from the posterior distribution and the hidden signal. This is the overlap between two different samples from the posterior measure. But there are this kind of new, uh, there are this kind of new object that appears naturally, which are kind of similar inner product, but, but sandwiched 
by the noise matrix. Okay? These are, are kind of reweighted in our product. Once you do that and you fix them by introducing delta functions, Fourier conjugates to represent everything in exponential form, preparing the field to uh, get uh, proper action, to do a saddle point computation, okay? What you do, what you realize is that the model we are studying is equivalent to one with that Hamiltonian, where T and T hat are this kind of order parameters and Fourier conjugates. This is an extended uh, statistical mechanics model with a part depending only on this tau and tau hat, and the part depending on x only collapses again onto a quadratic model, an SK type of model with a planted structure coming from there. This is a kind of complicated external <laughs> magnetic field where x is not just feeling x0 now, there is again a kind of hard to guess polynomial function of the noise appearing in between there, and here another polynomial function of the noise between x and x transpose. Okay, so this is a kind of planted structure at SK, and the mechanism to arrive, there, to arrive there is really strongly exploiting the rank one structure of the spike, or the low rank structure. You could extend to higher than one ranks, as long as it's finite. And the second novelty of the approach is that to solve the saddle point equation, you need to identify a novel object that I didn't see before in all this literature on structured spin glasses, which we coined the inhomogeneous spherical integral, which is there. We'll tell you what it is. And when you do the saddle point of the action appearing in that expression, with this integral there, that, form, that, that function here is some function of the other parameters and Fourier conjugates. It's not so important what the form is. You have a standard term appearing in this kind of dense uh, inference problems, which is the mutual information of a scalar denoising problem, a scalar Gaussian channel. Here is a scalar Gaussian. This is a scalar Gaussian variable that corrupts my single uh, component x star drawn from the prior with a kind of effective signal channel ratio q hat, which is part of this tau hat here. So this is standard in all these problems. The non-standard part is there. So let me give you a, an idea of what is this non-standard part. So I will first recall what's the standard spherical integral, which is the, the key object appearing in the analysis of these structured spin glasses. Let me define a matrix X, which is capital N by small n, with the rows Xi. So think of little n as fixed. It's a small number. It's, it's, it's 4, 3, 27, but it's fixed. Okay, while capital N will grow to infinity. The columns instead are large dimensional vectors, XL, okay. but you have few of them. And I will fix the overlap structure between these columns. Okay? I call this inner product QLL prime. Okay? The standard spherical integral, the low rank spherical integral, the rank little n spherical integral is this object here. This expectation is over the R measure, again, uniform, uh, uniformly sampled uh, orthogonal matrix. And here, what appears inside is a rank little n matrix, where D is little n by little n, okay? While this capital D is full rank, you can take it diagonal or not, it doesn't matter, because if it's not diagonal, you can absorb its basis in O, just require that it's symmetric. So let's take it diagonal, okay? But this is small rank. And actually, in the rank one case, this spherical integral is well known in, in spin glass literature. This is a structured uh, spherical spin glass. This is the measure over the sphere, because you see that if I rotate O times X here, this is like a uniform vector on the sphere. This O transpose applies on this X transpose. So I can replace this expectation by an expectation over the sphere. S is OX, and this D appears here. Okay. 
And if I, in the case of n equal to 1, this b is just a scalar. This q is just a scalar. So they multiply and gives me a beta. So this is the standard spherical integral. Sorry, shouldn't you have s square? Or, or I'm confused. Yes. I'm sorry. It was late, yes. <laughs> there is s squared here. Thanks, Silvio. And this integral is key in the analysis of Paisi and Potters for uh, their famous orthogonal spin glass model. It has been rigorously studied for any finite, and actually not only little, not only finite little n, it can scale at a certain speed with capital N. And actually, I think Justin will tell us about new results for this kind of integrals when little n is allowed to scale with capital N up to a certain speed. But a key result is by Maida and Guillonet, who have rigorous formulas for that. And recently, with uh, Manuel Saez, we, we proved for this model uh, rigorous formulas for the marginals, for the finite marginals of this kind of model. All right, now I place myself in the same setting, okay, still fix this overlap structure between columns. Now I need to introduce few notations. This is a tensor of with three indices. The first one, I, is the one which goes from 1 to capital N. L and L prime are finite indices, okay? I will define CI as this matrix which is little n by little n for each i, while CLL prime is a diagonal matrices, is, is a, are diagonal matrices of size capital N by capital N, which are those ones. So is the notation clear? Okay. It took me some, some time. <laughs> what I will require is that essentially the Empirical law of the CI converges in a certain sense. So if you take any bounded function f, it will require this convergence when capital N is going to infinity, where C here is a certain random matrix of size little n by little n, and it has a law okay, that I can define. Then this so-called inhomogeneous spherical integral is the following object. It is indexed by this random variable, C, and by this overlap here that I'm fixing. Okay. Is this limit, but actually, maybe you should focus on this second expression, which is equivalent, which I find more natural. You see that now, these replicas, thinking of LL prime as this replica indices, are jointly rotated by the same O, over which I'm uh, computing the expectation. But for each pair of indices L and prime, I can have a different coupling matrix. So it's truly a inhomogeneous version of the spherical integral. Okay? And indeed, it generalizes the, the usual case I presented before. Because if you take this tensor here, and you actually write it as a product <coughs> of a quantity indexed by L and prime, and another random variable depending only on i, you have this kind of decoupling, then this expression collapses to the standard lowering spherical integral. Okay? All right, so let me now give you an idea of how we, we understand what's this optimal pre-processing function of the data. We use this so-called adaptive Taules anderson palmer uh, approach of Hofer and Winter. The first step is to start from the log likelihood of the model, which is this trace of uh, this potential. And uh, here it's an equality. It's an equality, it's not a minus. Third typo, I'm sorry about that. It depends on a certain function of the norm of x. You have naturally, when you expand this potential you have to be careful because everything is non-commutative here. You have a certain polynomial of y that appears. And then you have kind of non-linearities like this of sandwiched inner product of x with the data. Okay, so this is the case of the quartic potential. But in general, you would have additional more complicated terms with, again, non-linearities and more complicated terms of that form. Okay? So it's a bit a mess. 
So what you need to fix is this kind of order parameters here, okay? Now I want to design an algorithm. I cannot, like in the replica method, decompose the data into signal plus noise. I don't know the signal. The only thing I'm given is the data. The gamma was the term controlling the strength of the quartic part in the potential. Okay. And mu, which does not appear it's inside this function, controls the strength of the quadratic part. Okay. So, I will fix, again, like in the replica computation, by introducing delta functions, Fourier conjugate to represent these deltas in exponential form, etc. What I obtain is that the partition function of my model ends up of that form, where I have a certain phi n here, which is a free energy, okay, kind of log partition function, where this j tilde is the matrix naturally appearing that I construct from this R, and from this term, doing the computation, you have additional terms that are added to this polynomial there, and you have a certain matrix J tilde at the piece. This is just a direct computation. I've done nothing at the moment. Then you use the ADATAP uh, formalism, and this tells you that this kind of free energies, if you trust the, the assumptions that mean field type of behavior should apply in that case, so here there is an assumption of validity. ADATAP tells you an explicit formula for this kind of free energies, and this kind I mean what? The type of free energies where you have a measure which is decoupled over the spins, here the entries of, of your estimator, and a structured Ising or a structured, structured SK model, a quadratic form like this, okay? So you use this ADATAP formula, you plug it there, and you write the saddle point, and it gives you again something that looks a bit like replica, but actually it's, it's not directly related, it's not easy at all to see the mapping. And if you perform the extremization over these other parameters that you fix there, you obtain that free energy. And what you can say from there is that your original model, described by this log partition function, is equivalent to this is a constant. That free energy here, where this, the matrix of interaction between your variable is this j tilde star. Where j tilde star is what? Is this j tilde that appeared naturally from the computation, by fixing the other parameters there, evaluated at the extremum values for all these other parameters. So this is the polynomial of the data that you obtain. So that's why I was saying it's non-trivial. There is a whole business there to arrive there, okay? Any question or? Well, another, another way would have been to put any function there. So which is a, another approach would have been to take j of y of a generic function to the state evolution and then optimize the MSC. Um, yes. No, yeah, but. I mean, the state motion is a complete nightmare. I think that, I mean, <laughs> the thing is that, no, I don't, actually you're right, because we have the, no, we have the generic state evolution for any polynomial function. So actually that's another way, you're right. <laughs> this, this is not how we, we, we did it. Oh, because the story goes in the other direction. We understood that you had to plug a polynomial function in the IMP through that approach. But you are actually completely right. From state evolution, from the recursion we have in the paper, you could then a posteriori guess what are the correct order. But the equations are truly horrible and I'm not so sure you can get you can help, you can get the, these coefficients easily. I think this is much more easy. Thanks. Uh, I'm almost done, so let me say words about uh, how we derive What's the strategy to obtain this regular state evolution recursion for this conjecturally based optimal AMP? Again, the difficulty comes from the fact that now we have a generic polynomial function there. So what we do is that we construct a so-called auxiliary approximate message passing algorithm, which is of the standard AMP form, okay? And by standard, I mean the form which is there, where you have the noise applying there instead of a complicated function of this matrix. Let me 
insist on the fact that this is not an algorithm, right? Because you see that here the noise appears. You don't know the noise. The only thing you know is the data. So this is just for the sake of the proof. We understand what's the dynamic of this auxiliary AMP. And this auxiliary AMP is chosen in a way, is constructed in a way, because the degree of freedom we have is the construction of these denoising functions there, and of these Onzager reaction terms here. It is constructed in a way that every k iterations, we are actually getting information about a certain power of the data applied to you, which is the kind of things we need to understand this dynamics there. This is a polynomial, OK? And by understanding this algorithm, we can deduce what are the correct ones that are there. This is, we don't use this as an algorithm. It's not one. It's a, it's a tool to understand the state of that one. Okay. So like I said, KT iteration of these uh, complicated iterations there give you essential information about one iteration of that one. Because here, if the polynomial is of order K, you see that you need to update that a number of times to access all these powers. OK, it's not so important. But there is a nice proof st strategy that as Marco Mondelli uh, developed, and it's, it's, it's uh, <laughs> 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 quick questions. I have one because from the beginning of the talk, I'm wondering, but maybe you have some. Uh, well, what's kind of a Example, maybe for some toy application where this where this noise would actually be. Yes, it always helps me to have something in mind. Yes, so actually, um, through the collaboration that Marco has in, uh, in Vienna, working with certain biologists, they are studying certain very large covariances matrices, and they have biological reasons to think that the information they want to extract is of a certain form. And if you process these covariances in a way that you extract this information, you, you can guess that what remains has strong dependencies. The fact that it's rotation invariant is an assumption. Of course, in reality, it's not. But it is clear that the noise in these problem, biological problems, what you want to, to denoise, has correlations. And this is a way to approach that. No, that yes, that, that I believe that in many practical cases it has applications. But whether the har okay that you say is not assumption. Yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay. Other questions?